after variety, I'm, so I'm told. I'm learning along this journey with everybody else. Look at Thomas putting in his step count. <laughs> That's awesome. To see a break of sweat during the, the community conversation. All right, let's uh, let's let's kick this off. As t we don't want to wear out Thomas all the way through. Um, welcome to the community conversations. It's hosted by the Autodesk community. Our community conversations are the new live virtual events designed to give expertise, connect with leaders, and grow your community network. My name is Sean Hurley. I'll be your community host. We are joined by the ever talented Jacob Small and Saul Amar. Uh, today we'll be discussing dictionaries and dynamo. Uh, I, as I said, I'm going to be your host. I'm Sean Hurley. Today I'm in Walla Walla, Washington. I just moved from Portland. Not moving to Walla Walla yet. I don't know where I'm at. I'm kind of a nomad right now. But uh, it is sunny, a little windy. Um, I'll hand it off to our experts. Yeah, so my name's uh, Jacob Small. Uh, designated support specialist for Autodesk based out of uh, our Boston office, which means I help uh, customers uh, with enterprise business agreements adopt our software kind of at a high level. Uh, and I am uh, pretty active in the larger Dynamo community. You'll see me on the Dynamo forums uh, at all hours of the night. So, uh, Sol, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome on board the Dictionaries train for today. My name is Sol. I'm the Dynamo product manager. It's my responsibility to sort of guide the, the evolution of Dynamo as we move into the future sort of be the, the curator of good decisions made on products. So I'm the person to blame if there's something about it you don't like moving into the not too distant future. Thank you. Uh, some uh, ground rules before we begin here. Everyone's line is muted to reduce, reduce the background noise. If you do have a chance to turn on your camera, your video, that'd be nice to kind of give us a, everybody knowing faces and yes, waving. And we get to see Thomas, well, he's gone off now, but he's on his treadmill. Um, you'll have the ability, like I said, to unmute yourself um, when we have a question. And uh, it's a conversation, let's keep it at that. You know, let's, uh, if you can hold it till the end, that's fine. But uh, if you have a question, this is, you know, this is a good time. Um, the sessions are being recorded and emailed to uh, attendees and uploaded to the community conversation site as always. Oh, and you can use your little, your little emoji things to raise your hand too, but we can unmute ourselves today. Let's not go crazy though. Safe Harbor statement, in a nutshell, don't make any product purchasing decisions based on any forward-looking statements or discussions about potential ideas or future features of the products. Use, use your purchasing decisions based on the product as it is today. That's it. This is you know, typical lawyer-friendly language. Our community conversations provide opportunities for engineers, designers, artists, and makers to meet in a safe, live, virtual setting to share expert expertise, get to know leaders in your field, and grow your community network. We're really happy to have you here. Just want to add that in there. Um, the sessions are always supported by the Autodesk community, ca uh, community managers to help guide the conversation, feed important insights back to from the community to Autodesk and to support participants in getting connected to the expertise you need. Moderator, please, that would be Kate, post the link into, yes, into our chat. And let's get started. There's lots to cover today, lots for me to learn. Thank you. Cool. So today uh, we're gonna try and look at, my fire alarm's going off, so can you take over? <laughs> Yeah, for sure. So we're, we're going to take this one by the seat of our pants today a little bit, I think. Uh, so welcome to Dictionaries in Dynamo. So today we're going to talk about a pretty cool feature inside of Dynamo called Dictionaries. Not to be confused, Sean, with, uh, you know, standard dictionaries where you we look up words, albeit particularly a little bit similar. So we're going to cover how that works today in around about a 15 minute presentation. This is going to be on dictionaries. We can have a, an awesome discussion about that as well. We're going to do a little bit of a live demonstration at the tail end, uh, which Jacob is going to take the reins on. Maybe I'll be narrating that section as well. 
And then there's a Q&A section at the end as well. So like as Jean mentioned, please do feel free to sort of button and raise your hand or speak out, or whatever you want to do. Uh, we're more than happy to have this as a communication, oh, sorry, as a conversation, not a communication, uh, together here today. It doesn't necessarily have to be scripted, so to speak. It's more about getting the knowledge out of our heads into yours and having an awesome conversation around the topic of dictionaries. All right, Jacob, can you do it or you're, you're buzzing in the background? It keeps starting and stopping because they're testing it. So if I suddenly go quiet, you know why. Um, so wanted to, before we can really get into dictionaries, we've got to talk a little bit about lists. Uh, so lists are kind of sort, sort of the default method of structured data in Dynamo. They're going to be index based, right? Which means we always start uh, kind of counting back at zero, right? Uh, the order is maintained and constantly consider, uh, considered, right? So we don't have to worry about stuff sort of getting shuffled unless we ran a function that told it to shuffle. Um, and uh, the great thing about these, because they have that consistent order, it means that they're iterable. We can always say for all the list of the things or for all the items in the list, go ahead and perform that function. Uh, the other thing with lists, they are nestable as you can see here. Now, uh, I did uh, wanna plug sort of some of the previous stuff on this uh, in particular, and I just grabbed the screenshot from the YouTube uh, playlist. Uh, in particular, the three sections on uh, list if you have to go back and cover those, those were six, five, and four uh, in the current playlist uh, up on the YouTube at that link there. Uh, you can also get there directly through the community conversations link that we posted in the chat previously. Cool, so conceptually, we're gonna talk a little bit about the differences between lists and dictionary. So thank you, Jacob, for covering the list aspect. That doesn't mean I don't have to necessarily on this slide. So the, the differences really are what Jacob has stated, which is that lists are an ordered list of items. So everything has its place and remembers its place. And the dictionary is conceptually a little bit like the Dewey Decimal System, if everybody's familiar with that, where you have a, a marker or a key, in this case, like a decimal, and you know where to go and find the information that you're looking for. So a dictionary has this notion of a key value pairing, which we're going to get onto in a little bit. Right, so the differences in Dynamo is what you see on screen right now. So if we're talking about a list and we're using a color range here as an example, the, the list or the preview data that comes out of the node of color range here is going to be exactly the same in the context of a list. It is an ordered list, like Jacob, Jacob said. If we're going to make a dictionary of this, it's going to become unordered, which means that every single time you run Dynamo or make a change at a new node to the graph that needs to be computed, that dictionary node is actually going to shuffle itself automatically because it's considered an unordered list, which means it doesn't care about the way that the data is structured in there because you do not, you no longer need to understand the indexing method of that because the indexing method has changed from a numerical format. So one, two, three, four, five, and so on into this key format. So you notice if you look on the right-hand side, we have two different watch nodes. The upper watch node is the list output, which is the standard data structure inside of Dynamo. And the bottom one highlighted in blue here is the dictionary output, which now instead of using the numbers, uses the keys. So I have put a key value here of red, orange, yellow, green, and blue, which correlates to the output of the node. But you'll notice that the dictionary itself has not retained that order. It is blue, red, green, orange, and yellow. And so the way that you pull data from dictionaries is by using the key values. And so this is this notion of this thing called a key value pairing. So dictionaries are conceptually prevalent across many different languages, and they retain the same kind of format inside of Dynamo. So if you want to have data, you will then go and associate this back to a key. So if you think about uh, an analogy and say Revit, where you have a parameter and a value, that really is a dictionary under the hood. So we're talking about the name of a parameter being the key and the value of that parameter being the dictionary content that comes out of that key. And so, and the nomenclature of design script, which we'll touch a little bit deeper later, this is looking at a, a key column value syntax, whereas list is just simply value, 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 which is just simply ordered and numbered rationally from the top down. And so dictionaries really only have two key requirements to them. Uh, the data that comes through can be anything on the value front, but must be unique when it comes on the key front. So there cannot ever be multiple keys within the same dictionary. So obviously if you copy and paste this dictionary into multiple places inside of your graph, you can have the same keys, but conceptually that might also get a little bit confusing later downstream. 
So uh, what, what we have here on screen is the ability to have any kind of string based value key as well. So you cannot use a numerical data or a different arbitrary data type as your key, but you can use a string and anything that sits within that string. So in this case, we've got Dr. Evil's favorite number with 1 million, uh, being able to use also things such as the apostrophes within that key value itself. And one thing you'll notice on the upper right-hand corner is that when we try to put in a non-string valued key, in this case, some numbers, it's just simply gonna spit out an error message and tell you that it expects a string as the input for that key. And if you feed anything else, it's really not gonna work. Cool, so I wanted to talk a little bit about sort of dictionaries and dictionaries and dictionaries, because I find this is kind of a must uh, when we get into sort of generative design applications. Um, uh, the way this kind of works, you can see here on this particular screenshot, we've started with just a list of all these different bits of info, right? So somebody's first name, my coworker Ali, the primary product they support, secondary product they support, and the person that they uh, report up to, right? Uh, so first primary, secondary manager. And I've got this nested list of lists, right, that I've sort of pulled through. I'm going to use a dictionary by keys values node then to sort of pull this out. So instead of having to worry about, wait a minute, what index was the manager at? Was that the fourth thing in the list? So that's the third index, right? Uh, so we could go through and we could do that thinking, or I could just call now for manager and get that particular value out. Uh, after that, and having sort of created that sort of original dictionary, I then went ahead and I added another dictionary that contains my list of dictionaries, right? Um, this is going to basically allow me to sort of call for desk four, right? And then who's, you know, the name of the person that sits there or what's the primary product that they support or secondary product that they support. Uh, this allows us to sort of store uh, sort of nested uh, repeated levels of depth uh, inside there. Uh, you can also store lists inside of dictionaries if that's uh, kind of what you were after or what you needed to do. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more and look at sort of applications of this as we get a little bit further on into our demo at the end. Uh, the other sort of key piece here to know about is how to sort of build the dictionaries and the de design scripts. So I touched on this a little bit before, uh, but the basic syntax is, you know, if we wanted to find a list, we use square brackets, and then we type everything that we want to type out right up in that list. Um, in whatever order we might want them to be, right? Put a comma in between each one of the values. Uh, with dictionaries, you're gonna first call out what you want that value key to be, make sure that's a string, uh, put the uh, colon in there, and then type what the value wants to be. So in this case, my first dictionary was defined over here as just an empty dictionary, just two curly brackets with nothing inside of it that will result in an empty dictionary, which we could then add stuff to if we wanted to. Uh, to sort of join content into uh, that uh, individual piece, we call out for the curly brackets. The first key that of my new dictionary, I'm going to set as my key, uh, and then the value for that is gonna be one. We can then call on our typical design script sort of solutions, uh, where here I've called for the node dictionary set value at key, uh, and then put uh, my dictionary that I'm gonna actually set the value for is the my new dictionary variable. Uh, then called out the key that I'm going to set is going to be, again, it's a string, so I'm doing quotes like crazy here, uh, my other key, uh, and then set that value to be two. So from here, I can start to quickly and easily pull that content out. So you can see here, I up at the top, I've called out from my new dictionary, square brackets, just like if I'm going to do list indexing, right? Only instead of calling for the index, I'm going to call for the key I want. So if I ask for my key, again, quotes because it's a string, uh, we're going to get the value of my key from that dictionary. If I ask for my other key, we're going to get that value. We get two. This means we can start to sort of quickly pull content through. And again, we're going to touch on this a little bit further when we get to the other uh, the demo. But uh, you can see there, I'm now able to say, okay, my key is equal to my new dictionary in quotes in that uh, those square brackets, my key. My other key is going to be my new dictionary square brackets in quotes, my other key. And then I can use those two values that I've pulled to set some new value. And then I can set those values as well. You can see I've just used the standard dot notation method to just sort of say for my new dictionary dot set the value at keys for my calculated key to be my new value. And now I've got that larger set of dictionary values that are sort of all included right in there. Hopefully that made some sense. 
yeah, so conceptually it might be a little difficult to, to read on screen right now, but hopefully by the end of today, you understand exactly what a dictionary is and how to get through it and how to use it inside of the Dynamo space. Uh, if you are somebody who is keen on playing with the uh, design script, great. Or if you want to play with Python, we're gonna to touch upon that next. So suffice it to say that dictionaries interop with design script like Jacob just showed, uh, expressed inside of the code block, inside of Dynamo, they also interop with Python too. So if you want to generate a, a dictionary inside of uh, Dynamo using the dictionary keys values, here we're talking about mutants and their superpowers, you can then pass that directly through uh, Python script and return that value and get your dictionary out the tail end as well. So if you're using the dictionary content, doing something to it, and then returning that dictionary content back inside of Dynamo, you can. And then also if you want to generate a dictionary inside of Python natively and then return that content back to, to Dynamo, you can too. So in the upper screen, you'll see some of the Python syntax that you need to generate using what's called a dictionary comprehension, a dictionary inside of the Python space. So dictionaries are interoperable between Python and the nodal expression and also the design script expression in Dynamo. It's a happy experience. Cool. So then we talk about iteration. So I think Jacob touched upon this a little earlier, which was that iteration works on lists. Great. That's kind of how they work. You know, take this function like a string.length node or a string.split node, and then just run that on every single thing that comes through a list. Uh, if we try to do that inside of Dynamo, you kind of, uh, Dynamo dictionaries, you kind of can't. So it's just going to fail and tell you that it expects different input types. So in this case, string, string split expects a string in a string, but was called with a dictionary in a string. It's not necessarily going to function so well. So a little bit sad, doesn't really work necessarily. So what we have to do is basically deconstruct those dictionaries. So we've got a couple of different nodes here that allow us to do that. From any single dictionary, you have a notion to pull out either the keys or the values or both. And we can then pull out the keys, the values, split them, and notice that they are going to now retain their exacting list structure because they're no longer a dictionary to then go and reconstruct that back into a dictionary at the tail end as well. So deconstruct into a list, iterate over that list, and then reconstruct into a dictionary. Hurrah, iteration wins, happy days. Cool. One thing to note there, you don't have to pull out all the key, keys from the dictionary. Sometimes you only want to iterate over one piece that's contained within. So you can call for that particular key and set with that particular key rather than just doing them all. Um, but in this case, it, based on the use, uh, it probably made sense to run through everything. Uh, next up, I wanted to give a practical example. This is a, uh, probably one of the first use cases I had for dictionaries uh, in my uh, sort of Dynamo travels, uh, which was um, looking at mapping uh, Excel data contained in an Excel spreadsheet that related to the building code. This was for the actual um, uh, occupancy load charts, right? So how many people can, does the building code expect to be in a given space? How many people can occupy a given space based on that use type, which drives our construction typology, our egress widths, our egress lengths, so on and so forth. So really, really important stuff. Um, a little bit tiny to see on screen here. So I, uh, if we want, we can come back and uh, touch on that again. But uh, you can see I've basically taken my initial Excel import data, read that content in, built a dictionary for every single row in the Excel spreadsheet by setting this to be at level two, uh, where now it's going to basically just ensure that my first column or my first row is my Excel headings, right? This tells me the occupancy type. Uh, this tells me the occupancy load and whether or not it's gross or net. Um, I then built a unique key for each individual row by looking down that first uh, couple columns, joining up those two strings into one uh, based on unique values. So if it was assembly, fixed seating versus assembly, uh, tables only versus assembly, tables and chairs, whatever else we may have, uh, join that into a single piece and then use that to build that other nest nested dictionary. From here, I'm able to quickly pull out whatever value I might want. So if I wanted to pull out, okay, for residential, I can just type residential and then I can say, what's the load factor? I can type load factor and it will return residential has a load factor of 300 square feet feet per person gross rather than net. Uh, for mercantile, right, we can type that in and uh, it'll come back and it'll say 60 square feet per person uh, net, so on and so forth. So we can quickly get to that content and then assign that back into the uh, original uh, keys, which can be really, really useful. All right, anything to add on that before we jump into the live demo, Sol? No, I think we probably covered most of it, the live demo. All right, let's, cue up that danger music. Um, 
All right, so this is our live demo. Whoop, I probably should have switched that slide. Uh, oh, well, doesn't matter. Um, what this is, this is uh, an example I presented with Alexandra Nelson at AU last year. Uh, this is from the generative design at Hogwarts uh, AU uh, class, which was a lot of fun to present. Uh, but basically uh, what it is, is we had a list of all the students from this particular example that were in Snape's first year potions class. And I didn't actually get all of them. I focused in on just some key names that we might all know. Uh, so when we look through here, you can sort of see how that data has come in from Excel. Uh, we've got our first, our, the student number, first name, last name, what house they're in, who they want to avoid, who do we want to keep them separate from, and what their individual needs are. So if you look at that first student, Harry Potter, uh, is in Gryffindor. Uh, we want to make sure he's avoiding students uh, at sort of two and three, and we absolutely need to keep them separate from student number seven. And we wanna make sure we have a line of sight to make sure that he's not getting into trouble. Uh, same thing, we've got Ronald Weasley here. Uh, he's in Gryffindor. We wanna keep him separate from Harry to make sure that he's not uh, causing mischief uh, and probably keep him away from Hermione as well. Again, this is from Snape's perspective uh, and as, as well as keep her separate from uh, student six, so on is, or keep Ron separate from student six. And again, keep line of sight to keep him out of uh, trouble. So we built that sort of initial list up. And then we use this list deconstruct. And that again is gonna pull out the first student from each or the first sort of row of information. That's the number, first name, last name, house, avoid, separate, in need. This is sort of the headings from our Excel chart, right? Uh, and then with our dictionary node, I can quickly build out using those first keys to say, okay, first name is Harry, separate, needs to be from seven, so on and so forth. And we can do that for Ron, Hermione, all the way down the list. Now, because I'm using a list to create the dictionary, it's maintaining that order, which allows me to get into some of the other sort of really fun stuff here. Um, we don't need to get too much into this, but this is a uh, list permutation, which is gonna allow me to basically take uh, all of those individual pieces, there are eight of them, that gives me a list of values from one to eight, and I can sort those values accordingly, right? So now instead of the previous order from one to eight, we're gonna permutate that list. I'm gonna to go to the uh, 10,743rd possible shuffle of these individual pieces, and that's that particular order. As I go to a different one uh, and run that graph in different values, you can see these pieces kind of quickly update based on what that sort order is, what that shuffle is. Um, so we can get different order. With that, I'm gonna take my list of dictionaries and sort them by those keys. So previously we had Harry first, and then we were able to sort of work our way through. Uh, we can then start to manipulate the, the dictionary, right? I'm gonna store the element ID uh, for the individual student placement family. That's what we were gonna use in Revit. Uh, we can set the value for the point to find out what the location for all the different desks that we had uh, sort of set up was. Again, I'm in sandbox, so I'm just looking at this through the data.remember node. Uh, and now I'm able to actually add a point. That's right, a dictionary can contain geometry. It can contain whatever we might want uh, inside that content. Um, go ahead and build one last dictionary using the value at key for number, append an additional value to that to make sure that's a string, and then set a new dictionary from the original list of dictionaries by those numbers. And that's gonna be where I really get to get into my dictionary magic here. So I'm gonna input just my dictionary as variable A, and I can pull out all of my keys. And I do this typically just so I can see what content I can work with. But now I can start to sort of pull out individual values from each one of those dictionaries uh, by keys, right? So we've pulled out the list of all the dictionaries into the individual dictionaries, and then pulled out the key for point. We've pulled out the list of dictionaries from the individual dictionaries, that's what that uh, keys is gonna be. Uh, and then it's gonna allow me to get the first name plus the last name, and that's gonna allow me to create that string in the background. So it's all just a matter of sort of constantly pulling the first value out of that dictionary, the second value, and starting to allow us to sort of do that work over and over again uh, with design script. It gets to be really, really powerful. And some of the other, uh, you know, 
generative design experts that I've talked to have said, really, in order to effectively do stuff like space planning at scale, where it gets to be really big, you really have to have a good understanding of uh, what those dictionaries do. Uh, that's a good point, Thomas. It is kind of like a, a database. The way I like to think of it um, is your objects become, or your design content becomes objects. Right, and then we're storing properties about those objects, uh, just like you would, as Sol pointed out before. The keys basically become parameters for Revit elements that we can then continue to manipulate uh, and adjust as needed. So, um, any other questions, guys? Feel free to pull them in uh, uh, out of the chat, uh, kind of as we go. Uh, let's go back. I'm going to come back and we'll, we can uh, sort of pull some of these other pieces apart if we want, or uh, we can go back to that other example that I presented before. Um, let's actually do that. We'll look at uh, sort of nesting the dictionaries here. Give me one second. There's a little Easter egg while Jacob's doing that. Uh, if you'll notice, some of the nodes inside of Dynamo are actually outputting as dictionaries. So if a single node outputs so if a node has a single output, it's going to output as a list. And if it has multiple outputs, it's now outputting as a dictionary. So if we're talking about design script here, you can actually pull those dictionary keys as an output list as well inside of Dynamo. So if we're talking about, say, a list.fills by Boolean mask node, you have the outputs of in and out. You can simply put in square braces, uh, you know, in and out, and actually pull only one of those return values instead of having to pull both and then subsequently deconstruct that string at a later date. So Jacob's going to go and demonstrate that now. It's a pretty nifty so, way to keep a pretty clean, uh, you know, operation with design script. So you can see here, we've I've built this list from one to ten. I'm going to use a Modelo node on that. To say, is the value of a divided by two? What is the remainder? Right. This is basically going to let me know if a number is uh, even or odd. And then we can uh, sort of put that content into this list filter by blue mask. And now we get this dictionary as an output, as Sol noted, right? Now, the Dynamo by default, when we have nodes, is gonna sort of break those pieces apart. But if I had said, let's go ahead and switch this over to design script, you can see that first value that's output is actually the dictionary, right? And then it's saying, give me the value at of T2, which is this sort of original filter by Boolean mask, uh, get me the value at N. And that's going to show us just the list of included values, right? Or get me the value of out. That's just the list of excluded values, right? Um, the other way we could do that is we could just say T2, square bracket in, in quotations, square bracket, close that out. And I'll put one more watch note on here. You can see here that's now pulling that same content uh, that we were uh, looking at before uh, if we looked at the in values instead of the out. All right, so multiple ways to sort of call from that. This method is more like the list.getItem at index method. Uh, this is sort of the de design script shorthand. Yeah, design script contains a lot of little shorthand uh, shortcuts, as the case may be. And that is a pretty awesome one to use if you want to only pull relevant data from the output of a node. So this is um, that other example that I mentioned before uh, that's going to show uh, kind of how to import the Excel data. Um, the actual Excel spreadsheet um, looks like, of course, Excel is not opening on my other screen. This is when danger music is used, correct? Yes. Uh, so you can see here, I've written out kind of what the use might be uh, kind of uh, anecdotally followed by the actual function so that for airport terminals, we've got multiple load factors depending on the actual function inside the use. Uh, this is kind of a manipulation of the table directly from the international building code uh, in terms of how that content might uh, look at. So the sort of thing that you guys have to do all the time for different types of projects, right? Uh, so I've read that content in. You can see here, again, we've got that use function load factor load type uh, kind of listed out up across the top. Uh, we then go into this list deconstruct. Again, the output of this node is a dictionary, but our uh, outputs are actually going to sort that out. So you can see here, this is that initial upper level. And then I'm going to use that to quickly build out this dictionary where I'm now going to be able to say, okay, I've got a dictionary for this particular 
function of accessory, accessory storage areas with that particular use, or uh, as I get a little bit further down, use of airport terminals, baggage claim, use of uh, airport terminals, baggage handling, use of airport terminals, the concourse, airport terminals, waiting area, so on and so forth, kind of all listed out and through. At the same time, I'm gonna take the first and second item from each one of the lists of the uh, remaining values. Right, so we're getting this and that, uh, which you can see there. And then I pull out the unique items at level two. So this is gonna allow me to quickly say, do I have multiple values in my original uh, Excel file, right? Airport terminal baggage claim, airport terminal baggage handling, whereas before uh, ag accessory storage areas, agricultural buildings returns just the single value. Join those two pieces together, pull this out of the list because that returns a nested list by default. And then I can use that to pull one more dictionary. Now I can quickly ask for whatever piece that we want, I may want to ask for. So if I wanted to ask for just residential, we can pull out residential and you've got the, all the nested dictionaries uh, for information uh, about residential. Once I actually hit run, uh, I thought it was an automatic run mode there. Um, so you can see here, now we've got just those individual pieces and now I can pull out what's that load type. Or if I wanted to type out uh, dormitory, and I wanted to get not the load factor and load piece, helps if we actually spell that correctly. Uh, maybe spelled differently in there. Let's do a dictionary keys node. And let's see what we've got for uh, different spelling options. Oh, dormitories. Knit spelling matters. There we go. Um, so that's going to allow me to pull that piece up, and then we could pull out, you know, the function, the load type, whatever other information I may want. Or if we wanted to, we could associate that to additional uh, content, like I mentioned before and showed in the uh, previous Harry Potter example. You can layer in those other uh, kind of content. Thank you for uh, pointing out the spelling errors in the chat, everybody. Um, Definitely key spelling points for David and Thomas uh, with the I instead of the A. Um, spelling is certainly not my strong suit. Uh, but again, we can start to pull that content through. So you can imagine if you had a list of Revit rooms, their uh, actual use and their function, you can now sort of quickly pull through uh, and get the individual uh, load types and load factors, uh, pull the parameter values for or the geometry that shows what the exterior perimeter might be, uh, and calculate how many people want to be in those individual rooms and then spit that back into a new parameter inside the room um, inside Revit or if you were doing it in AutoCAD you could write it out as a uh, block or something like that. Cool. And one other thing to note um, on the spelling front is Dunro is mostly pretty uh, fickle, not fickle, uh, serious about spelling so you have to be careful with how you do spell things otherwise it might not work there are some nodes out there that don't care so much i know john pearson in his package has some nodes that don't care about spelling uh, as much or at least capitalization um, but typically you will want to be a little bit careful when it comes to what you're putting in to dino when you start spelling things yep keeping it to numbers you can work with definitely helps um, and as you get more familiar with the individual words uh, that also helps So conceptually, this wraps up dictionaries. It's a little shorter than what we've previously presented over the last couple of weeks, the last couple of months. Uh, but it is a very, very, very powerful feature. So if you do want to start jumping into dictionaries, please do. It's something that can really superpower your Dynamo scripts. It's something that's not always going to replace uh, lists. Lists are definitely still very, very useful. But in the context where Dynamo dictionaries do sing, they are extremely powerful. And it's a good way to start managing your data, especially in large graphs that where that data could potentially get lost or jumbled. And so you do have the capacity of dictionaries also to remove the need for more nodes. You can potentially get your graph done in less nodes by using them as well. Yeah, and they also process much, much faster is the other piece because of the way the text is sort of serialized. Um, good question in the chat from Ellie Sol. Um, will dictionary nodes be 
supported in Dynamo Player as an output anytime soon. So I know we can mark those as output. I haven't tried this in 2022 yet, so I don't know if Dynamo Player's sort of modified that to take it, but I know it wouldn't work in generative design. Right, so uh, to the best of my knowledge, and I haven't tested this either, uh, no additional types have been expressed as outputs inside of Player yet. Uh, but there is a team actively working on improving player as we speak right now, uh, doing some pretty cool things with it, starting with the back end, moving into the front end into the future. So expect changes and expect good things to come in that space. So if anyone else has any other questions, please do sing out. If it's on dictionaries, great. If it's not on dictionaries, that's also cool. So any other Dynamo, generic questions we're more than happy to answer so feel free to to sing out and you can unmute yourself if you have a question yeah thank you kate it was so thorough there's no questions I mean, conceptually, dictionaries are pretty simple. I think the power comes from when you start playing with them and start exploring what they can do. So I would encourage everyone on this call and anyone else who watches this later on to then definitely jump into Dynamo dictionaries and start exploring their potential and exploring what they can do and looking at some of the examples that exist outside of that space. I have a question. Sure thing. Um, so I've lately, well, I don't have that much experience with Dynamo. I definitely have been learning it over the past few months, um, diving in deep. But most of the time when I use Dynamo so far, I'm using it with existing geometry, such as um, when I had townhouses that I was working with, I was taking the common walls between rows and early in the design process, uh, the developer didn't really know how high a common wall needed to be. The tenants were terraced, so they were like each one was four feet higher than the next. And sometimes those heights would shift based on, based on what the civil engineer would uh, show as far as dirt moving and all that. So basically, I'd have to take the common walls and for various reasons, made them multiple walls instead of just one large wall because the shapes were cantilevers and stuff. So I used it to move the walls up in height or down as I needed to if let's say a four foot height changed to a three foot six and instead of taking each wall and say base constraint go down top constraint go down. I would just I wrote a dynamo script to move it all down, but it seemed kind of. Uh, I basically still am wondering if there's some way that I could use dictionaries for like family types parameters or something like that to shift things around easier or does that not really because I was using a fair amount of lists and but I still had to filter out a lot of things um, get rid of all my exterior walls get rid of all my non common walls and so I had to filter out a lot of stuff which made the graph a lot longer than I expected it would be when I started making it so basically, would there be a way to use dictionaries or lists or some form to condense that? Keeping in mind, I'm still very much a beginner in design script and Python. I know of their existence. I'm not very experienced at them. Sure. Um, so personally, I would likely stick to lists for that particular example, just because you've already got kind of a single object that can be a bit of your data store with the wall. So uh, case in point, if the base of the wall had to shift down, I could find out sort of how far that has to shift down, right? There's some kind of measurement that says, okay, the base needs to go from 50 feet to 48 feet based on civil having to cut more dirt, dirt for whatever reason, right? Uh, so we can quickly take that object and then just adjust that object. Uh, one thing that can help when it comes time to sort of figuring out like, how can I make this run faster is to, leverage the uh, tune-up view extension, uh, which is show tune-up. So I might need a hint here. Yeah, it's, it's under view. So if you don't have it showing up under view, it wouldn't be installed on this. Oh, uh, okay. Good point. I thought this was by default, but it's not. Um, let's go back over to Revit because I believe it's over there. Um, view. No, it's not installed here either. All right. 
it's not by default currently uh, out of the box in any Dynamo install. You have to get it via the package manager. Yeah, I thought, so I thought I'd it, migrated my packages, but apparently not. Uh, nice. Uh, so if anyone who has not heard of TuneUp before, what Jacob is finding is an extension that our team has created. And we've released it on the package manager basically to get it out there faster than in a release cycle. And in the future, we are going to wrap this in to be baseline functionality. But what it does is it just tells you how long each particular node takes to execute within your graph and also how long your overall graph takes to execute as well. So it's a, we, we call it profiling in terms of the, the terminology around what it's doing. So it's basically profiling your nodes and profiling your graph. And it gives you breadcrumbs or indications on where you can potentially look to improve your logic flow within your graph to try and make a more efficient uh, graph itself. Yeah, so you can see as I build this up, um, get location. And it looks like I probably need to restart on Dynamo after installing the piece because the chart's not actually formatting. Uh, but you would see the actual runtime uh, pulling through. Uh, Jacob, try yeah. dragging the extensive it open slightly bigger. It might be a, um, if you click on the actual just size. There it goes. Yep. All right, so we'll hit force re-execute and you can sort of see the amount of time that it took to get that information. Uh, sort of showing showing up there. So we can sort by uh, execution time and find the slowest node. So the slowest node uh, was, um, it's actually a, a mix because it was sort of super simple uh, with the get location and the other piece, but the overall runtime being two milliseconds, right? Now, um, if I did, instead of that, uh, element.geometry is going to be a little bit slower typically, but it still might be a little bit too quick for us to really see. Um, so yeah, we'll hit force re-execute. You can sort of see the element geometry is the slowest node uh, in the group, right? So that would be the one that I would want to try and work with. So in your case, where you're trying to sort of figure out what's the, the pieces, um, I would probably just take sort of the, the git location, uh, which is going to give us the bottom of the wall and then figure out what that distance down to the new civil grade is, uh, and then set that element. Uh, base elevation one by one, but just continue keeping to use this one Revit element as my uh, sort of dictionary container of sorts, rather than trying to go back and do them the other direction. All right, thank you. No problem. Good question, by the way. So we have another question in the chat from Alex Reed. Uh, Alex, did you want to speak out loud or do you want me to just read it out? Uh, sure, I can I can clarify because it, it might not be super <laughs> explained in my chat there. Um, uh, so I think in the example, Jacob, that you were showing a second ago with the the dictionary example is is a great kind of um, uh, data set to use for this. But it, it's effectively when when I'm building a Dynamo script and I'm using dictionaries, by the time I end up getting to the end when I'm actually setting parameter value by name. Um, I can't figure out how to get the actual lacing and the, the list level to work. So that way I don't have to have a, a set parameter value by name for every single parameter that I want to set, um, especially when I'm dealing with kind of nested dictionaries where I have an example like you had shown before with um, uh, having a dictionary that has each space uh, and the values for the, the properties of each one. So for occupancy, the, the function, the description, the, the gross or net, um, those are great examples where how would, I, how would you go about actually setting all those at once so that you don't have to kind of use individual paths for every single parameter that you want to set? Sure. So I would start by, I'm going to just real quick um, make a dictionary. Mm -hmm. Whoops. I spell the values again. Every single time. It gets me every day. <laughs> all right. So my, uh, my values is going to be this. I'm going to use uh, LM. plus one dot dot yes, core dot this dot counts. That's supposed to be a plus. Yeah. And it should be good there. So now this is going to combine element plus a number from uh, for the overall length. So yeah. LM1, LM2, LM3, that's going to be my keys. All right. So now I've got an object, a dictionary that contains just kind of an object, right? Mm -hmm. um, we can then pull from this uh, piece 
uh, if we wanted to build this as kind of a nested dictionary, um, let's actually set this as level one. Does that make it? Yes, there we go. Okay, so um, we don't need to use this just yet. We can use just element for now. All right, so now I've got a list of dictionaries that contain my element. Mm -hmm. uh, from there, uh, let's go ahead and get our location. Uh, from our element. And then let's take that line and say start point. And I'm going to sort of combine this with the other, uh, the other question, um, point dot Z. This is going to give me kind of the elevation of the start point of the wall. And then I'm going to create a string from that so that I can store that in our comments field. All right, so now I can set value at key for this dictionary. We're gonna use uh, levels on these two pieces and my key is going to be um, Elif. So we've got element elif because mm -hmm. I wanted to be confusing with similar sort of pieces. Uh, now, when I run this, we've got a wall and an elevation mark. Um, let's do element dot bounding box to get the overall height of that element. X points. And I'm just going to copy these two pieces down as well. All right, so that gets me the height of all of my walls. And now let's do another dictionary value at keys, because I'm assuming you're doing this. Uh, overall, let's actually change this to base too. Probably want to do a little bit of math for taking the top minus the base to make sure it's accurate in case your walls are not on the ground plane. Cool, let's try that out. So let's take um, A bracket base. So we can't pull that out because we've got a list of dictionaries. Let's actually call out A bracket zero to get rid of our list. And base I spelled with a capital B, capitalization matters. Minus, um, actually, let's just do this here. Get rid of that silly extra list just to keep things nice and clear. And now we can call for A bracket base minus A bracket top, capitalization matters. Uh, but I turned those into strings, so let's not do that. Oh, okay. Right. So we yeah. did base minus top. Mm -hmm. I did that backwards. Top minus base, 20. And now we can set the value for height. Right. So there's our values. Here's our dictionary. Key is height. So now I've got four pieces. What we want to do now is we want to take the element out of the dictionary, which we stored at that A bracket LM bracket. This is going to be our actual element. And we want to make sure that we're doing this in case you've got nested dictionaries instead of going back to the other element. Mm -hmm. uh, we pack that in. Uh, might as well uh, sort of run run with that. So you can see this is still a Revit element. Um, we still have our green highlight, which in Revit, like some of the other integrations, means I can click and it'll bring me to that particular uh, element. Be a little bit better if I had centered that on the left side. There we go. So you can see I'm switching between those different walls. Uh, then we've got to figure out what we want the parameter name to be. So I have 
no good parameters built in here that I can really work with beyond comments and mark. So I'm just going to use um, a brackets uh, top as our comments and a brackets base as our mark. You probably wouldn't do this, but we've got nine minutes left and I don't have time to set that up. Um, we'll build this as a list. So we have a single list containing all the tops and all the bases. I'm gonna pull this out of the nested list format as well. Highlight these two and I can hold down shift, click and drag to uh, get rid of that extra list. There we go. Uh, now let's do a list.transpose. Here's our good, right? Uh, we're nice and big here. Uh, all right, so top and base are comments and mark. as our parameter values, and then here's our values. So we're gonna wanna work with level one, parameter name also levels and also levels. Mm -hmm. and now when I run this, you need comments. Thank you, Eli. Eli. Spelling strikes again. <laughs> How many times has this happened in this particular session? Uh, storage type is not a number. Oh, okay. A plus string. All right. And placing longest run. Hopefully that, there we go. Yep, there it is. Yeah, okay, this makes a lot of sense. I think what I was doing before is I was, I didn't realize that you you also are packing the wall into that dictionary as the element. Um, what I was doing before was creating a dictionary of just basically values that, that were, say, uh, the wall type name and using that as what I was trying to do as a lookup in the dictionary and then pull something else from that same dictionary to populate the wall. But that makes a lot of sense to actually to put that actual element into the dictionary and use that as your organization method. Yeah, you could use a um, GUID, right, as well, if mm -hmm. you wanted to, let's say, be able to also write out to Excel and refer back to it, uh, mm -hmm. so that you could pull that through and then just do element by GUID. Uh, that's something I've used in the past. Um, but yeah, anything can go into a dictionary, right? Um, I, haven't, I haven't found anything that doesn't pack into a dictionary yet. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, leverage that, that information. Yeah, thank you very much. That was really helpful. No problem. Any other questions? That was awesome. And the fact that dictionary is the the what we're covering here and spelling came up is kind of <laughs> random. It's meant to be, Sean. It's meant to be. <laughs> the universe works like that. Yeah. And how, how, how many kilometers do we have, Thomas? How long was this this community conversation? Four four and a half kilometers. Oh, he's he's measuring in time. That's a that's a, a nice long walk there. All right, I'm going to go ahead and save this, uh, and I'll see if we can get the DYN posted up onto the uh, community conversation page, uh, so that we can go from there. Let's bounce back over. I know I've I've got to close out the PowerPoint. And Jacob, if you could just you know, maybe a resource, a, 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 a graph that had a whole bunch of lists or example ones. We had that question. Be great for people to play around with them. Yep. All right, so we have a, a few more Dynamo sessions planned. There's three here on screen, as you see right now. So the next one we're gonna be discussing is Dynamo graph annotations, which is all of the cool ways you can organize your graph content to make it easier to use for you and other people. Bearing in mind that uh, when you annotate your graph, the predominant user or beneficiary from that is going to be yourself in the future. Mm -hmm. We're going to have a special guest with this as John Pearson. So if you're not familiar, John is the author of the Rhythm and Monocle, or the Rhythm Package and the Monocle extension. And he's going to jump in with us next time in two weeks from today and start talking about what well, we'll talk about, the out-of-the-box features that you get with graph annotations. And John will talk about the stuff that he has delivered to the community via his own packages and extensions.
And then we're going to talk about further in the future, a little bit about how to plan a Dynamo graph and also how to extend Dynamo itself via extensions. Excellent. Thank you, Jacob and Saul. Um, let's wrap up today. we got two final slides. Uh, Kate posted uh, the, uh, the other ways to uh, connect and with a, a few resources. You can explore the various Autodesk communities. And next slide, please. You can explore the various uh, Autodesk communities, including global network of user groups in the Autodesk group network, our industry-focused communities helping you your colleagues solve business challenges together, the Autodesk forums, of course, and staying connected with us on Twitter. Thank you. Yeah, thank you to everybody who participated, all the fun. I hope you learned a lot out of it as well as had some fun. Uh, we appreciate you uh, uh, attending the community conversations. We welcome your feedback. We'll be sending you a couple, uh, well, actually we'll be posting a, a survey for you and stay connected. We hope to see you again next time in the series and spread the word. And yeah, we special guest next time. Not to say that Saul and Jacob aren't special. <laughs> Maybe not, not as special as John. <laughs> how do, J Jacob, how do you spell special? Uh, hold on. Let me open up Word that has a spell check. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, everyone.